Welcome back to Adam's Everything EV. This is the EV80 Kit Podcast. I'm Bitter Betty, of course, and that's a Fisker joke. But let's get right into Fisker. There's an SEC probe. We should probably look at that. SEC has issued a subpoena to bankrupt carmaker Fisker indicating possible probe. Emphasis on possible? It's an absolute possibility Fisker is the target of an investigation. Okay, there's a dozen other reasons why there could be a subpoena as well. We don't know any details. What we do know is many of us have encountered alleged things of interest that could be considered criminal and lead to civil allegations or referrals to the Department of Justice. Is it fair that the things that happened to own Owners and shareholders happened? Absolutely not. Will we ever get a clear picture even if there are civil cases? Probably not. The full picture will always be a mystery and will never fully come out publicly just like some of the sealed items in the court docket that contain things that we really would like to read or observe. Settlements prevent those things from being publicly available. What can we do? Depending on who you are, cross your fingers and continue to have faith in the scales of justice. Let me know what you think's going on in the comments. Next up, we have to talk about the hearing that was today, August 19th, and there was supposed to be a Chapter 7 conversion. Heights has been pushing and pushing and pushing for this Chapter 7 conversion, and now they're completely fine with Chapter 11. All right, here we go. Settlement term sheet. The debtors, Heights and the committee, collectively the parties, agree to support a liquidating Chapter 11 plan reflecting the terms set forth in this term sheet. The debtors shall be required to comply with the budget attached as Exhibit A. Heights and the committee will have a right to withdraw their vote or support for the plan in the event there are administrative expenses that in the aggregate exceed the settlement budget. Yikes. The plan will provide for the creation of a liquidation trust, the Heights Trust, with a trustee appointed by Heights. On the effective date of the plan, the effective date, the following assets, A, B, and C, collectively the IP Austria assets, shall vest in the Heights Trust, the debtor's intellectual property, the debtor's intercompany claims and interests in their foreign subsidiaries, and Heights claims against Fisker GmbH Fisker Austria. In addition, on the effective date, the following assets shall also vest in the Heights Trust. Heights share of proceeds of non-IP assets pursuant to Section 7 and Heights share of proceeds from the estate claims pursuant to Section 8. The plan will provide for the creation of a liquidation trust and together with the Heights Trust or the trusts with a trustee appointed by the committee, the liquidation trustee, and together with the Heights Trustee. General unsecured creditors shall receive their pro rata share of interests in the liquidation trust, entitling each of them to a pro rata share of the portion of the estate claims, non-IP assets, and proceeds of the IP Austria assets allocable to the general unsecured creditors as provided in sections 6, 7, and 8 below. There'll be $300,000 allocated to operate the liquidation trust. The trustees shall consult with each other regarding key decisions made with the IP Austria assets and the non- IP assets. All distributions from the liquidation trust will be made by the liquidation trustee or its designated agent. And then here's your settlement. The first $40 million in proceeds of IP and Austria assets net of reasonable and documented trust expenses shall be distributed as follows. 85% to Heights, 15% to general unsecured creditors. To the extent the net proceeds of IP Austria assets exceed $40 million, then such net proceeds in excess of $40 million 50% to Heights, 50% to general unsecured creditors. And that's for Austria. Non-IP assets. Remember, the IP goes to Heights. All cash as of the effective date and proceeds of non-IP assets net of reasonable and documented trust expenses shall be distributed 50% to Heights, 50% to general unsecured creditors after payment of the following amounts. So 50-50 after these three things. All allowed administrative and priority claims, the reasonable and documented professional fees and expenses incurred by Heights in an amount not to exceed the aggregate amount paid to the committee 
committee's professionals and the initial liquidation trust funding amount. So after the 300,000, that's letter C, legal and professional fees incurred by Heights not to exceed the aggregate amount paid to the committee and all allowed administrative and priority claims, it's 50-50 split on non-IP assets. And that's your non-IP assets. The estate claims, the first 40 million in proceeds of estate claims, net of reasonable and documented trust expenses shall be distributed as follows. It looks like the Austria thing, but flipped. 85% to general unsecured creditors, 15% to heights. And that's net of reasonable and documented trust expenses. To the extent the net proceeds of estate claims exceed 40 million, then such net proceeds that are in excess of 40 million are 50-50. And that's the estate claims. Number 15 talks about Fisker owners. The liquidation trustee shall take actions reasonably practicable to address or facilitate the remediation of open vehicle recalls as of the effective date and to otherwise ensure existing debtor vehicles remain safe and operable so long as the cost of the foregoing does not require payments to the liquidation trust in excess of $750,000. So that's basically what was dictated in the fifth cash collateral order. To the extent open vehicle recalls exist as of the effective date, the parties will negotiate terms in good faith that will allow for the Heights trustee to make the debtor's intellectual property transferred to the Heights trustee hereunder available to the liquidating trustee or its designee at no cost for the avoidance of doubt other than any costs associated with the liquidating trustee and or its designee's use of such intellectual property to the extent necessary until any open vehicle recalls as of the effective date have been reasonably addressed. And it looks like the resources available will need to be used to fulfill these recalls. That's basically what this paragraph is saying. Let's look at the Austrian insolvency proceeding number 21. Any agreement on the terms set forth in this term sheet is contingent on agreements satisfactory to the debtors, heights, and the committee being reached regarding a restructuring plan in the insolvency proceeding of Fisker GmbH Austria currently pending in Austria. So it basically says all of this is contingent upon an insolvency proceeding completely separate to this insolvency proceeding. As part of and subject to agreement being reached regarding the Austrian insolvency proceeding, Magna and Heights shall not elect to opt out of third-party releases under the plan as provided in section 11 hereof. Number 11 says the proposed plan shall not contain consensual third-party releases with opt-out release mechanics. The members of the committee other than Magna and Heights will each elect not to opt out of such releases. The judge mentioned that was a Purdue thing. Purdue explicitly does not decide what qualifies as consensual release, leaving unresolved the issue of whether an opt-out release in a Chapter 11 plan constitutes consent. An opt-out release is a plan provision whereby a creditor is deemed to consent if it fails to opt out. And this is a little above my pay grade, so I'm assuming that's what 21 and 11 are referring to, is that Purdue thing. And it was very clear in the hearing this plan is not complete, at least documentation-wise. Council to Heights will draft and circulate the plan, the proposed order confirming the plan, and the cash collateral order. Debtors local council will draft and circulate the disclosure statement with respect to the plan and all solicitation materials. The parties will work together to prepare any additional or ancillary documentation that is required. So what does all this mean? The chapter 11 liquidation plan. There's a set budget. If the budget isn't followed, Heights will pull out and go right back to a chapter seven and they have the right to in the terms here. Two trusts will be established, the Heights Trust and the Liquidation Trust. It will cost cost $300,000 to set up the liquidation trust. Inside the Heights Trust, there will be Fisker IP, Fisker Foreign Interests, Fisker Austria claims at an 85% portion of the first 40 million and 50% in excess. There's also going to be a share of the proceeds of 50% of non-IP after administrative professional fees and liquidation trust funding. That's your 300 grand. Also, Heights share of the proceeds of estate claims, 15% of the first 40 million and 50% of estate claims in excess of 40 million. In contrast, the liquidation trust contains the rest, general unsecured creditor claims, estate
estate claims, non-IP assets. Austria claims portion 15% of the first 40 million, 50% in excess of 40 million. General unsecured creditor non-IP proceeds. That's after administrative fees, professional fees, and liquidation trust funding. And then as far as estate claims, the liquidation trust gets 85% of estate claims after the first 40 million and 50% of estate claims in excess of $40 million. As far as ocean owners, there is a line item that details the completion of recalls. And these are some of the highlights that I was able to identify in the absolutely no time since the hearing. Also got a bunch of updates from the Fisker Owners Association. Let's look at some of that stuff. My questions would be the following. Will there be spare parts support for EU owners of Fisker Ocean? Talking of fair price for spare parts, what sum are we talking about? That one's really tough. Fair price means availability, what the market will accept, and all of those other things, as well as technicians. And we can assume the technicians are not going to gouge. That's one of the goals of the Fisker Owners Association is not to gouge customers with technician fees. But if they charge you for room and board because they had to travel somewhere, they might have to do that. And that's not going to be considered gouging because do you want the part or not? So in the realm of fairness, you're not going to be able to go to Advance Auto Parts, pay $99 and just be able to slap the thing in there at your local wherever you go. It's going to be much more complex. In fact, the water pumps are the same. You're going to have to pick up a water pump from a place you've been designated after they're shipped to said place, then you'll have to show up at an authorized place to install it with the water pump yourself and get in line in order to get the water pump installed. That could be hundreds of miles for you, depending on where you live and what those circumstances are. So fairness is going to be a whole new realm for you if you're thinking that you're going to get any kind of traditional ownership experience. Not going to happen. As far as water pumps, yes. Europe and UK will get water pumps. Parts is going to be bad for everybody. We'll get into that in a second. What parts are ocean-specific parts and what parts are general? Pretty much everything in this car is a specific part. This is a Chinese car that was built at a Magna facility, and the big problem was that, you know, documents were signed off, allegedly, that QA didn't have to be done because there was such a hurry to deliver the cars. Some of those places, like, for example, the vents manufacturer, are completely out of business. And what happens to the vents? I'll just do exactly what the FOA did when they were asked that question. That's the answer on the vents. Literally nobody knows. And everybody is eventually going to have some form of this problem if they haven't been fixed already. And even if yours have been fixed, they may have been fixed with faulty vents. There's a rumor that the Mach-E water pump is the same water pump as the Fisker Ocean. That doesn't mean it fits or will work or could be installed. It just happens to be the same hardware in one way or another. And those are the kinds of things you're going to encounter when you own an ocean going forward. These questions are all individual and specific, and each individual part you may need could be extremely easy or absolutely impossible to find. The risk is yours. What is the forecast for the ocean future in the next year? Less stuff is going to work. More people are going to have problems. Six hundred people now have a ticket, and that's not going to go away. In fact, one of the things priority is moving towards right now is people being stuck inside their vehicles. That's right. I'm not joking. I didn't say that wrong. People are stuck inside their oceans. They tell you to try all four doors, including the trunk, and there's a five-pull CPR style one, two, three, four, five method that they're recommending. And that's all that really is going on right now is recommendations, FAQs, and lists. I'm not trying to say that the owner's association isn't doing the best they can. I am certain that they are, and there's a lot of manpower there, but it's voluntary manpower, and it's definitely contingent upon other parties cooperating, and not everyone's going to want to cooperate with the company or associates or affiliates of a company, which is how they would consider you as a Fisker Ocean owner, that never paid them. Ever. Like Tom Tom. So the forecast is just going to be bad. Ownership will continue to get worse. 
individual items will be solved. That's what you're looking at. You're looking at a mountain of dues. And when I say mountain, I mean more than zero. You will have to pay to know how to fix your car. You will have to pay to make sure someone either comes to you to fix your car or you'll have to pay somebody specialized in fixing your car. In a bag of chips! <laughs> the expense will not be reduced. There are no economies of scale. There are only 10,000 cars total and American Lease has 30 some hundred of them. My future forecast for the next year, I had a comment mentioned, your last few videos didn't have opinions. Well, if you'd like my opinion, I'll get the f out. I took delivery so I could test it. And even in taking delivery of it, knowing I would have it for a limited period of time, I still got caught up in all of this loss and problems. And it's just gonna be bad. G.I. Joe. Buying one at 20,000 and under, extreme. Low miles, parts will be available. <laughs> laughing emoji and software support has been sold to american lease and they are already rolling out updates to some cars with issues the battery cells alone are worth a significant chunk of that then the parts you can sell to others probably more than the whole car is worth there's an example at least the last part of that there's a lot to unpack there but the last sentence in that shows that there are going to be people that are going to buy these to strip them down and gouge you on parts with intent. So, no, that's coming. Let's address the rest of this erroneous verbiage. Parts will be available. Uh, super blanket statement. Who told you that? I'd love to know. In fact, nobody told you that. The FOA advised you drive carefully for the current time because of the extremely limited access to service and extremely limited access, if not no access at all, to parts. Software support has been sold to American Lease. Also incorrect. TomTom Tom wants to end everything with everyone, including American Lease, and that's also part of software considering it's navigation. TomTom Tom is gone as of September 12th if the motion that they proposed is passed. It was suggested that CarPlay is significantly complicated, which would make sense because GM has removed it completely from their EVs. That's right, a company like GM doesn't think it's cost effective to have CarPlay. I don't know how individual ocean owners are gonna fare in the CarPlay front. Finally, in terms of connectivity, be prepared to lose connectivity until the owner's association can find a solution in the event they can find a solution. Because navigation most certainly is going away and everything else is gonna have to move to different ownership. Updates are rolling out to some cars with issues. The number of people who are being locked in their cars is quote, incredibly concerning. And yes, 2.1 will brick your car, especially if you don't have all of 2.0. NHTSA is being made aware. The resolution is hurry up and wait, put in a ticket. Your 12 volt battery is very important in your ocean and in order for it to function with reliability, a battery monitor and a trickle charger are things you're probably just gonna have to get. 2.2 is late testing phase, no confirmation on whether the braking issue that is occurring will be fixed with it. And so of course I responded to this comment with almost 100% of this comment is inaccurate. But thank you for giving me the segues I needed to talk about some of this stuff. You know of any sources anywhere for the water pump replacement part, you seem to know more than most of us any chance ace to buy one some way if you are looking to buy a water pump because your car is bricked and you want to jump the line i don't know what to tell you there is a line there are people that are bricked because of the water pumps that's obviously why there's a recall uh start in the northern european countries they seem to have had more impact but i'm pretty sure those resources are either uh, legally prohibited at this point or exhausted. If you want a water pump, you'll have to wait until this recall is in place. And it is moving. There are parts being shipped. Uh, La Palma is a rumor. The Netherlands is another rumor. These are not final destinations for the water pumps, but there are pumps being moved around the country and there are people allegedly trained to fix them. So... If you are waiting because your car is bricked up, uh, sit tight and man, I feel for you. Let's go to EV debunks. My three reasons for not switching to EV is the excessive user tracking those cars do and phone home. Are you referring specifically to Tesla? I think all cars at this point have some kind of cellular access, which makes them totally trackable in whatever ways that car company decides. Did you read your user agreement when you signed up? 
because you signed one. Basic car functionality buried in software apps instead of physical buttons. This is hilarious. Have you ever seen an OBD2 scanner? It is literally a car made of computers and sensors. Let's roll a clip of some of the sensors that EVs don't have that computers run in your gas car. Third, the car has one item in the battery that if it fails is insanely expensive with gas car parts will also fail, but no single parts is that great of a cost. The battery is insured for eight years or 100,000 miles, no matter which vehicle you buy. Is your engine insured for that long? Ask a Nissan owner. If his transmission is under warranty for 100,000 miles or eight years, you might be surprised at that answer. Bonus, I loathe touchscreens outside of phones. They always become laggy and unresponsive as apps are upgraded and time passes. Electric cars that are not of the Tesla mold of a giant screen for everything are fine in this regard. Tesla is the most updated of all the cars that have screens. And at this point, if you buy a new car, they all have screens. Subaru is like the most antiquated company when it comes to moving forward with technology, yet all of them have a 17 inch screen in them. So thank you for all of your EV debunks. I was able to debunk just for you or anyone else listening. My actual response to this comment was all new cars track you. My Honda Prologue has all manual buttons and physical vents. And what parts on a gas car have a mandatory eight year, 100,000 mile warranty? Every single EV in the US has that warranty on the high voltage battery, but I'm not telling anyone to switch. Next, we got to talk about sodium batteries. Sodium. Batteries. The driveelectric.gov public charging infrastructure playbook was recently released and I'm glad that they've done something. And when they input their local area, it just comes up, well, you don't have enough. So I decided I would put my money where my mouth is. And on top of never having a sponsor on this channel, I get offers, but I do not have sponsors on this channel. I decided to take my own money and buy an EV charger and give it to my city because PlugShare looked like this for the only one that they actually had. It's been dead for two years. I was able to get in contact with the city after writing an actual letter. I took my $200 3.7 kilowatt charger, handed it over to the city, and within a week and a half, they installed it in the old position with my hardware that I gave them. So I'm out uh, 210 bucks and my city now has a real charger. Are level twos the answer? Sometimes, yeah. If there's no DC fast charging at all, putting a level two in takes a desert and moves it from undrivable to passable. And if we can put level twos everywhere people park, then the DC fast chargers don't need to be any more abundant than they are right now. Companies can focus on functionality and profit because at the end of the day, we need these companies to profit. That's why you don't see enough of them. To get that charger installed, I had some help from my local government and one of the House of Delegates members in my state. His name is John Williams. This is him. You can contact him to thank him if you'd like. Is this car worth 20K I've seen online? There's no warranty and many things that are easy fixes or simple services could potentially cost a lot more if there's even a fix available. Insurance will be prohibitively expensive soon as the company is about to go out of business completely and you'll have to join a special group with potential expensive dues just to have a chance to use it normally. These are just the problems I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, and parts, there's basically no guarantee for most parts. One out of 10 do not recommend. This is a cool show car, a neat story, and a big problem waiting to happen for a daily driver vehicle. If you want to buy a $20,000 EV, there are plenty out there. Look at the $25,000 mark and look for an eligible EV tax credit contender. By the way, in my last video, I said that a Volkswagen ID4 got a $7,500 credit when it was used, but it's actually a $4,000 credit. Sorry about that. But yes, look at used EVs in the $20,000 range. There are a ton and you can get them with super low miles, way better than a Fisker Ocean in basically every way, except physically looking at it, at least if you don't mind looking at a car that doesn't move 
potentially. And I hope you like how I snuck that used market report in there. The last story today is of a personal nature. We did take delivery of our Model 3 refresh since our last video. The Carvana experience was good, took a little longer than we anticipated. The Tesla experience overall was good, took a little longer than we anticipated. I'm pretty sure the vehicle we bought was a reject. There were many paint flaws, almost all of which I was able to correct completely with a full polish and ceramic coating. I'll be posting that and my Fisker Ocean ceramic coating videos on my detail channel soon. It's bold, it's beautiful, it's red, it's fast, it has 380 some miles of range. Connie absolutely loves it. And since she drove a Model 3 Standard Range Plus previously, there was almost no transition at all. I'll give you her first impressions and driving experience in the next video. Stay tuned and subscribe for that. That's it for the EV80 Kit podcast. Make sure you check out ev80kit.com for ideas on how to be polite and learn about a great or at least improved DC fast charging experience. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Join Patreon or become a YouTube member for early access to videos. Subscribe for more and we'll see you on the next one. Hey, smash the like button. Thank you.